would say probably my favorite part of being on the internet is the end of year lists. I love them. I say the earlier, the merrier. I love a best of list. I love a worst of list. And today I'm going to be talking about the best nonfiction books that I read this year. I love nonfiction. I feel like I read a lot of nonfiction this year. It's slowly becoming almost my preferred reading material. Not to say that I don't like fiction. Sometimes I really just crave a story that I can get lost in. But there's something about nonfiction that has just been really, really drawing me in. Gonna make myself comfortable here. It's really been drawing me in. And I have found some of my favorite stories this year were stories that people had actually lived. And it might've been a memoir, it might've been a medical text, it might've been just these sort of newspaper articles that have come together to create a book. I had an amazing time reading this year. So I have 10 books for you today. Number 10, Dope Sick by Beth Macy. This is all about the opioid epidemic kind of raging within the United States. Macy takes a look at people who have explicitly been affected and people who have been kind of on the sidelines of watching somebody be affected by it. She goes over so many different cases and so many different valleys of effect. It's a really unfortunately accessible thing and that's what Macy looks through in this, how it became so prevalent within so many people's lives. But yeah, number 10. Enjoyed it. Really good, really good. Number nine, Rogues by Patrick Radden Keefe. Patrick Radden Keefe, he's been bringing out bangers, that's for sure. He has Say Nothing, he also has Empire of Pain, which is basically the same sort of story as Dope Sick. But this is Rogues, and the reason Rogues isn't higher on this list is that it's already published news articles that he's just compiled into this particular book and made it into, you know, a big collection. This book would be higher, but there were certain stories that absolutely just made me snooze. There were some stories that I think about quite often now. I was doing a puzzle while I was listening to this. It was deep in January, I believe, of last year, and it still stuck with me. It still makes me think about the stories that I listen to. This is all about people who have led these non-traditional lives, had these non-traditional career choices, or just been kind of the, these undigestible personalities, made these horrible decisions and kind of makes you question why they did it. Keith does great journalistic rummaging through their lives and makes you really understand them and does a lot of like bonus interviews so you get a fully sculpted image of who the person was. It's like this one about this wine, this fraudulent wine cellar. <laughs> There's somebody who testified against this mobster and is in hiding. It's that story. Really interesting cases, but some kind of, you know, oh, I was snoozing. I was doing my puzzle and I just could care less. But good stories overall. Really good. Yeah, good. Made it to number nine on my list, so. Obviously, it's great. Obviously, it's great. <laughs> okay, okay. Now, I always have a rule on this channel that you can't really judge a memoir, right? I feel like it's not correct to judge somebody's life, especially if they're pouring out their emotions onto the page. It doesn't feel like it's, it's proper of me, of all people, to say, no, that wasn't good. I'm trying to kind of keep my opinions of memoirs to just very base and understanding level. But this book was a new recent acquisition and, oh, I don't even have it. Hold on, let me find it. Where is it? Where are you? Ugh. Oh, and I have a check in it, nice. Don't wanna show that on camera. But this next book that I have now found was a recent acquisition. It was sent to me by Spiegel and Grau. They kind of sent this in the middle of a rainy day and I opened it, I wasn't anticipating it. And this book really shook me, totally shook me. It's a memoir by the actor and writer Rob Delaney. I had absolutely no idea who he was. Didn't even know what this story was. And I read the back of it, knew that I was gonna cry, 
And I, of course, did cry in my local library as I finished it. And that is A Heart That Works by Rob Delaney. This book is so sad. It's so sad, but what I liked about it was that it took this incredibly uh, kind of formative stage of grief in somebody's life and makes it a fully felt emotion for every single person who's a part of it. Not just Delaney's family, but also the reader. You feel like you're a part of it. And no matter what you've encountered in your life, you've encountered something emotional and very taxing on who you are. And this book makes it feel like it's okay to add humor and it's okay to see the light in the situation. Essentially what happens in this is Delaney's young, young, young son, I think he's less than a year or two at the oldest, is diagnosed with this illness and right away you find out that he passes. This is kind of like a grieving portrait of a family overcoming that grief and kind of latching onto the hope of the future. And it's so vivid. If, if you've ever experienced any sort of extended hospital stay, I think that this will resonate with you. If you've ever been around somebody who's in a hospital, or if you've ever had something so sudden drop into your lap, this book will resonate with you. And it's a beautiful book. Rob Delaney, I don't know if he's exactly my type of humor, but there's moments where he's really, really getting into it deep and then he just cuts a joke and you know, oh yeah okay, it's okay to take a breath when the emotions are kind of coming. But I really loved this. I really was shocked at how much I liked this book. I really just thought it was gonna be kind of a breeze, but it just hit me right in my little heart and melted the ice right off of it. I think everybody could read this and get something out of it. Okay, so we are on to number seven. And this wouldn't be a list, an end of the year wrap up list if I didn't include one of my favorite authors of all time. And that's John Krakauer with Iger Dreams. I've talked about this book recently in a video, kind of winter books. And if you couldn't tell, that's a winter book. That is absolutely a winter book. Yeah, no lies seen there. That's snow on that mountain, if you still needed clarity. These are all articles written by Krakauer in his early years. They're very slim, each of them. You don't really get stuck in too dense of a story for a long time, but essentially these are all mountaineering stories. These are all outdoor stories. It all looks into different niches within the outdoor world. I was just thinking the other day that there was one about these dueling Alaskan pilots, one trying to become kind of the monopoly of Alaskan airline pilots, the ones that drop you off to a small destination island so that you can camp or look at grizzly bears, I don't know. They're just all of these really, really niche, like little macro groups of people in these insane spheres that he shones light on it. He does it so well. I mean, I love John Krakauer. Anything he touches, in my opinion, is just journalistic gold. This is fantastic. I loved it. It's great. Come on now. Come on now. I'm a simple girl. I'm a simple girl. I stick into those patterns. And then, of course, after seven. Seven, eight, six. Six, eight, seven. Six, eight, seven. <laughs> Number six, we have The 90s by Chuck Klosterman. Oh, I love this. I really love this. Chuck Klosterman to me is a hit or miss. Sometimes he feels like he's like a cool critic guy, a little too cool for me. But when he does it right, he does it right. And this was a great book, especially someone who was born in the mid 90s. This feels like it is a perfect love letter to nostalgia for me and also parts of the 90s that I don't necessarily remember but need to kind of affirm like, oh yeah, that did happen, right. Oh, wow, I didn't understand the magnitude of this event that he's talking about. And this is all just about the 90s, the cultural impact of the 90s, sports, impact of the 90s, the technology of the 90s, just all of the little bubbles of the 90s. People are loving the 90s right now. It's very hip and trendy. And if you really want to investigate what that era was, definitely read this book. I thought it was fantastic. I really, really liked it. And it has a smashing cover. Smashing cover, baby. 
Before we get into number five, I want to give a huge thank you to today's sponsor. We're talking about nonfiction today and the impact that nonfiction can have on you and the, the, the things that you can learn. And speaking of learning, let's talk about Skillshare. What makes Skillshare so unique? It is the largest online learning community for creatives with a wide depth and breadth of topics ranging from illustration, graphic design, photography, creative writing, animation, fine art, music, music production, film and video, marketing, productivity, freelance and entrepreneurship, among a slew of other things. And whether you want to learn the basics of watercolor or painting or learn how to start your own creative business, Skillshare has classes to take you from beginner to pro alongside a supportive community. It is a world-class community that connects teachers and members and members to inspiration and feedback from like-minded creatives. It has a learn-by-doing approach to teaching where each member can create and share a project after completing a class. It's an on-demand platform with stackable lessons so members can learn at their own pace, no matter the skill level, and you know that's important. I have been teaming up with Skillshare for a while now, so I have an extensive layer of classes that I've been indulging in. I've been working on editing, I've been working on iPhone photography, I've been working on sign language, I've been working on auditioning. There's just this huge array of classes that you can engage in and it's it's kind of limitless. Anything that you want to work on, there's an option for you or at least some sort of facet of this interest that you might have. This month, what I've been working on is actually color grading for videos. Sometimes I feel like my videos look a lot more radiant than others. Sometimes I feel like I rely heavily on the camera to kind of help pick up things, but I really want to capture how to correctly color gradient and make it true to life and make it a really enjoyable aesthetic experience for the viewers at home, which are you. <laughs> <laughs> and as always, Skillshare is offering an amazing deal. The first 500 people to sign up using my link in the description will get their first month for free. Give it a try, give it a whirl. It's a lot of fun. I think you'll like it. I think you'll like it. And now back to number five. Number five. A Little History of the World by E.H. Gombrich. I had bought this a while ago probably about three years ago, and I told myself that I would read it this year. I was half dreading reading this because I thought it was going to be really, really impenetrable. I thought it was just gonna be a lot of historical stuff coming at me, and I was gonna snooze because while I love history, sometimes historical writing can really bog you down, but this did it. This was fantastic. Essentially, this was written for like younger people to have just a general timeline of history. I think that this worked really well for me. It's a really great refresher. You could read this in like three days. It flows incredibly well. It makes you feel like you are not alone in wanting to try to understand history in just very basic layman terms. I think sometimes you see books like this I have like a running joke with these types of books that they all look the same. They have that black font, red font, and then just like a weird stencily looking illustration. And you're like, I'm not gonna touch that because that is daunting and scary. But touch it. It's a great book. It's a great touch. It's really fantastic. And I loved this. I loved it. I think about it all the time. And I had somebody staying at our house and I was like, touch any, read any book you want, I don't care, and he read this book and he said it was fantastic and so he encouraged me to pick it up and I'm happy that I finally did, so number five. Number five, the number four. We're getting to the top of the tops. The top of the pops, if you will. Number four is a book that I picked up in a Goodwill. Actually, the next two books I picked up together. It was just a day at the Goodwill. It was a good day of books at the Goodwill. And this book I picked up and I knew about this author, I knew about who they were, but I didn't really know what I was getting into when I picked up this book and I'm so happy that I did. It was like a crash course in art history impact, if that makes sense. Let me just explain what it is. Regarding the Pain of Others by Susan Sontag. Very small book 
incredibly small book, a day read, which I think is the intention of this, to kind of read it in a day, absorb everything that's being said because there's so much to be said and then use it as a cross-reference as you kind of go through and dissect other images that might pertain to what this is about. So this is all about historical photos, drawings, paintings that have had these incredibly impressive impacts on human emotion and kind of uh, pivoted the outlook on certain events because of these these images like a lot of war photographs a lot of really graphic medical photos as well and just kind of looking into how the public opinion can be swayed just through the weight of what an image is portraying it was so interesting and i think what was maybe the most interesting part for me was there were so many particular images that you know we all know or we've seen in books and textbooks when we're going through school or in museums you don't know the names of them and Sontag has made a pretty amazing like Wikipedia page basically of famous images and when you're reading along you kind of see what she's talking about and then you, she comes across something and then you're able to look it up and it just kind of makes the the, it's like a sensory overload, this book, because you have images and then you have words and it's really, really comprehensible. And I thoroughly enjoyed my experience with this. I was reading this in the park and while I was doing my laundry and it was a day that the heavens opened and it just poured down. So I was like, oh, how fitting, how fitting. This is my own little image to tie back to the experience of this book. Just absolutely painful great book though very morbid but very interesting though not gratuitous like definitely interesting oh my god so number three number three oh my god we're in the top three and i think i made very good choices i think i made very very good choices i think that i have absolutely said the correct ones I don't second guess it. So let's get into it. Why don't we? The top three. And again, this was a book that I found in the Goodwill. The Goodwill was hot that day. Very, very hot. This is Crackpot by John Waters. Oh, he's a very polarizing figure. I understand that. Not everybody loves him, but I do. I think he's a hoot, has a lot of opinions. And I agree with a lot of those opinions. So I think that this is a ride. I toyed with whether or not this was fiction or nonfiction, but it is nonfiction in my opinion, or at least lead you to believe that it is nonfiction. Some of the stories obviously some have some really great artistic liberty, but a lot of them are from my understanding, stories of his own musings, stories of things that have stuck with him that he needed to get on paper. And I, I loved it. All of the things that he found beautiful, tacky, amusing, and fun. And yeah, this is just like hilarious to me. It's hilarious. I laughed out loud so many times and he's just a wild little bunch of oats. <laughs> Alrighty, alrighty, we're in the top two, we're in the top two. The next book might, maybe it's a little surprising. It surprises me that I enjoyed it this much because I'm not a medical text girly, I'm not. But this next book was so enthralling for me. It kind of radically shifted my perspective for a couple of days and that is An Anthropologist on Mars by Oliver Sacks. Again, a book that I had sitting on my shelves for an incredibly long time and that I just wasn't picking up. My friend had given this to me like two or three years ago and I wasn't reading it for some reason. And I made a video where I was trying to reduce my screen time on my phone and I felt like this would have been a great companion for that. Just looking into the inner workings of the brain and these very spectacularly different brain patterns for certain individuals. Essentially what this is, is it's looking into about seven particular instances of people whose brain workings are not normal. 
Sachs was the doctor in a lot of these cases, or at least he went out of his way to research all of these cases, just trying to understand what made these people's perceptions of the world so unique and what was going on in their brains. And what I like about this so much is that it cherished the inner workings of these brains that at the time, specifically at the time when it was published, it wasn't kind of widely accepted. I was nervous that it was going to be a lot of medical jargon that was gonna go right over my head, but it's really not. It takes everything and makes it a story. He wants you to understand what it meant to be these people and what it meant to learn about these people. Totally cherished experience that I had with this and I loved it. I really loved it. I really loved it. All right, number one. Number one. I don't know, could you guess it? If you've, if you've watched me all year, could you guess what it was gonna be? Maybe, uh, maybe I think you could. Wild by Cheryl Strayed. I'll be honest, I've known about this book for years, absolutely years. I think it was shoved down everybody's throat for a really, really long time. I figured, okay, it's gonna be cheesy. You know, it's, it's like in every waiting room with the doctors and just felt like it was just so, in my face. I was like, no, I'm not gonna pick it up. And then I think, I don't know, I saw it somewhere this year and somebody was talking highly about it. I was like, okay, why don't I give it a try? If anything, it'll be like an audiobook that I'll enjoy, hopefully. I have an intense interest in one day hiking the Appalachian Trail. This book isn't about the Appalachian Trail, but it's about the Pacific Crest Trail, which is what Cheryl Strayed hiked. And that is basically the main premise of this book. Cheryl Strayed set out to hike the Pacific Crest Trail with little to kind of no major experience doing an extensive backpacking tour. She was out there for three months. She had so many vivid recollections of it and it was a life-changing experience for her when she was in a very vulnerable and dark place and it completely took her out of it. Oh my God, this book, <laughs> I, I get it. I get why it was a national bestseller. I get it. This book was absolutely fantastic for me. I loved this book. It encouraged me in a way that I hadn't felt encouraged in such a long time. I listened to this when I was going on runs, when I was feeling like I was down, I'd pop this in and I would just check in on Cheryl, where she was hiking that day, how many miles she was doing, how bad she was sweating. I was so enamored with this book and I think about it all the time, all the time, hands down. This was like a life-changing book for me. If there's any sort of like endurance that you're trying to channel in your life, it could be with anything. It could be with sports, it could be with studying, it could be with, I don't know, a job, whatever. If you need something as like a pick-me-up, this is a perfect, perfect, perfect book for that. I loved it. I loved it. So that's it, guys. My top 10. What did you think? Was it expected? Have you read some of these books? What was your favorite nonfiction book read of the year? I actually would really, really love to know. I love reading all of the book suggestions in the comments. You guys are always wonderful. You're always fabulous. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you to everybody new that has joined. It's so nice to see 20,000 people. That's astonishing and I'm really just, moved that you're all here. So thank you so much. You guys are wonderful. You're fabulous. Thank you so much for being here. I will see you in the next one.